Good morning, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. So for those of you who are joining our community Seder tomorrow night, second night Seder, you're in for such a treat because in addition to beautiful teachings and experiences that Rabbi LaBelle and Rabbi Tzadok and Sammy, our rabbinic intern and Hillel have put together for you, you're also you're going to have Hillel's music guiding you through the Seder. Um, and I can't wait for you to hear the Dainu that Hillel introduced to me. This is, and to our community really, years ago. This is a beautiful Sephardic melody that originated from the Jews of Salonika, Greece, and it stirs the soul. Um, it is, it's so moving. It's so different from the way that um, that that we I was raised uh, to sing Dainu, which I also love, but it just uh, there's a kind of yearning in this version that makes you stop to think about what's really this prayer about. I, I wanted to just spend a few minutes with you today reflecting on Dainu, on this prayer, this song that enumerates the many acts of love and protection that God showed to us in the course of our exodus from enslavement in Egypt. It is gratitude upon gratitude. It's miracle upon miracle. The problem with this prayer, as many of you know by now, is that as soon as you actually start to pay attention to it beyond just the, the music which carries you, you start to see the real conundrum of the prayer, which is, of course, had God taken us out of Egypt but not helped us cross the Red Sea, Dayenu, it would have been enough, we say. But of course it wouldn't have been enough. We would have been slaughtered by Pharaoh's army at, at the sea's edge. Had God split the sea but not led us through it to dry land, Dayenu, we say. But of course that wouldn't have been enough either. We would have drowned in the sea. So what if we had made it across the sea but then not found the manna, that miracle food, to survive in the desert? That, of course, would not have been enough. We would have died from hunger in the desert. And what if God brought us to Mount Sinai, but didn't give us the Torah? You understand the problem with the prayer. So the question, of course, is what does it mean to say enough when really what we've got is nowhere near enough? We struggle with the meaning of this prayer, but we love the song. So we either come up with clever interpretations or we rest on the fact that it's just poetry and it's not meant to be taken literally. And also it's almost dinner and the kids are hungry and it's really not the perfect time to get into a rigorous theological debate, which leaves us with this prayer, Dayenu, as probably one of the most well-known but least examined Jewish pieces of liturgy. So this year, I, I wanna share something that I learned that I found absolutely astonishing that came from Rabbi Ari Schwartzberg at Shalhevet, who's one of the teachers of my, of my daughters. And let me just say, thank God for really great Jewish day schools where, where the rabbis who are the parents of the children learn the great Torah from their children's teachers. Rabbi Schwartzberg teaches um, an incredible <laughs> lesson about Dayenu that I never heard before that I wanna lift up for us this morning before we go to Seder tonight and tomorrow night. So here's what he shares that um, an early second century Christian author named Melito Asardis wrote an aggressively anti-Jewish treatise called Peripasha, which means on the Passover. It essentially makes the early Christian supersessionist argument that the reason that God's covenant with the Jewish people had been replaced by a new covenant with the followers of Jesus was because the Jews were fundamentally ungrateful that we were an ungrateful nation. And in this treatise, Melito enumerates each event of the Exodus narrative and points to Israel's ingratitude every single step of the way. So here's a taste of this treatise and see if this sounds familiar. It's called Ungrateful Israel. How much did you value the 10 plagues? How much did you value the mighty pillar and the daily cloud and the crossing of the Red Sea? How much did you value the giving of manna from heaven and the supply of water from a rock and the law giving at Mount Horeb and the inheritance of the land? Now, when you hear this, you have to ask this question, wait a minute, when was Dayenu actually written? If this guy Melito is writing this text in the second century 
and it so closely mimics the text of our prayer, could it possibly be the fact that, that our liturgy is a line by line refutation of some ancient anti-Semitic text? This song that is at the, the heart of our Passover Seder it is a thoughtful refutation of something that, that enemies of our people once put into writing. And the answer is we don't actually really know for sure if that's the origin story. The first time Dainu appears in a Haggadah is hundreds of years later in the ninth century. Um, Seder Rav Amran, written by Rav Amran Gaon, the head of the Jewish Talmud Academy of Surah. It, that was hundreds of years after this anti-Semitic diatribe. So yes, it's absolutely possible that even hundreds of years after Melito's critique of Judaism, our ancestors were still struggling with these claims against us, which by the Middle Ages had already proven deadly for hundreds of years. So it's absolutely imaginable that our rabbis developed a liturgy as a kind of public refutation of, of criticism against our people. We're not who you say we are, we say in Dayenu. No, we're grateful. We're not an ungrateful nation. Even if God had only taken us out or only given us the Torah or only given us the mana, that would have been enough. I'm kind of blown away by this interpretation, I have to tell you. I'm not 100% convinced that this is how it went down. There are some scholars, I started doing a little bit of research and, and, and people like Dr. Louis Finkelstein dated Dayenu all the way back to the second temple period, which would have been hundreds of years before the birth of Christianity and long before Melito's anti-Jewish diatribe. So it might not be the case. The truth is we really don't know for sure. If Dayenu did not emerge in response to an anti-Jewish polemic, it might have grown out of our own discomfort with the way that the Israelites behaved in the Torah, the way that our ancestors in the face of nature bending miracles again and again and again lose faith, question God, rise up against their leaders, beg for a return to slavery in Egypt. It's right there in the Torah. In that case, Dayenu is an internal attempt to make a tikkun, a kind of corrective to what we see as our own ungrateful nature. Don't we want to be a people for whom any one of these great miracles would have been enough? Don't we want to live from abundance and not from scarcity? Here's what's really clear, both back then and also now. It is in our nature to see what we lack, even more so than to see what we have. It's our nature to focus on what's missing at times at the expense of even holding gratitude for what we've got. It, it says in Kohelet Rabbah, no one departs from the world with half their desire gratified. Someone who has 100 wants to turn it into 200. A person who has 200 wants to turn it into 400. This instinct is as old as humankind. I, I wanna say that without the instinct of unrest, without agitation, without sacred dissatisfaction, we as a people, we would never take risks. We would have no fuel to fight for personal change or for social change. But that spirit of ingratitude, of it's never enough, that can also deplete us. It can leave us feeling empty and bitter. It can make it so that we miss the small miracles because we're busy waiting for the big ones. And there's at least some part of me that believes whether it was in response to Christian polemic or an in, in internal criticism ourselves, that part of the reason we sing Dayenu in the Seder is because when we look back in retrospect now at that journey, from enslavement in Egypt to liberation, from degradation to dignity, from darkness to light, when we look back at that now, we can see the big picture. And we wished that as we were experiencing it, we were not feeling resentful and frustrated and depleted, but instead our hearts were filled with gratitude and anticipation. I'm so struck by this Torah this week and I wanna share that there are a thousand applications to this, but this strikes me so personally this week because this has been an, an incredibly challenging week. As, as many of you know by now, last Friday afternoon, just before Shabbat came in, one of our beloved community members, a board member, a parent in our ECC, Ali Weinstein was 
out for a run before Shabbat and she was struck by a drunk driver who flew through a red light. And she suffered severe life-threatening injuries. She was taken into the ICU where she spent the last week. And in the course of this time, as the doctors have fought to keep Allie alive, this community has shown up in absolutely extraordinary ways. Prayer circles, hundreds of people, thousands of people lifting their voices together and offering their love for Allie and their support for Allie's family. Within 24 hours, there was a meal train set up that was booked for the next four months. We had to shut the meal train down because there were too many people offering to bring food for Allie's kids and for her husband. Some of Allie's friends who might be the best people in the world set something up called Camp Weinstein. This is an opportunity for, for friends from all around the country to support and engage Allie and Jeremy's beautiful little girls while their mom is in the hospital. So just before Shabbat came in, while I'm writing this sermon about Dayenu, I got on the phone with Ali. I talked to Ali, and, and I, I wanna tell you, she asked me to share with the community that she's doing okay, that she, she survived this and she's healing. She's out of her third surgery now and she's recovering. And in the course of only a week, she, she has been pulled back from the edge of the abyss and, and we're seeing her heal now in the most astonishing ways. I'm sharing this with you, this, this deeply personal story, because this is also the story of our community and it's also the story of our time. There, there are gonna be more surgeries, there are gonna be other challenges to confront in the days ahead. But right now, Ali asked me to share with all of you that she is grateful to be alive. And she's grateful for this community which held up her family in this time. And she is giving everything she's got to her healing process. And believe me, she's fierce and she's strong and she's going to push through this. And she already had some ideas about some fundraiser she wants to do when she's able to get back to work on our board. In other words, Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu that she survived this horrible accident. We're in such a different place this Shabbos than we were last Shabbos when we first learned this news, Dayenu that she's being cared for by the most exceptional doctors in an incredible hospital, Dayinu, that she has had her family by her side every single moment through this trial. Dayinu, that her family is, is held and loved by layers and layers and layers of community. It's not everything, but it's a lot of something. And in this moment, Allie's holding this as a moment of gratitude a and her family, they're clear-eyed about the challenges ahead and they know, we all know it's gonna be a long and painful process to recovery, but, but Allie's ready to face these challenges and to channel her fierce, extraordinary sp spirit into the healing process. And, and I know that there's Torah for all of us in this. And of all the times in the last year that I wish that we could be in the same room together as we talk this through, as we cry and as we celebrate together, this is that moment. I wish that we were together to have this conversation right now because this family is choosing to live right now, not in what's been lost, but in what's been won, in what we've still got. And to see in that a blessing and a miracle. When we come to our Seder tables tonight and tomorrow night, I really hope that we remember that part of this great redemption story, in addition to overturning systems of injustice and planting the eternal seed of hope, part of it is also reclaiming our agency through choosing to live with gratitude. It's in our nature, all of us, to focus on how much has been lost, how far there still is to go, how much is missing. But in our culture, of entitlement and ingratitude, of disappointment, of dissatisfaction, where nothing, nothing, nothing is ever enough. Dayenu provides us a kind of counter testimony. Could we train our hearts to find gratitude even still? In, in Pirkei Avot, Ben Zoma famously asks, who is rich? He says, Hasamech Bechalko, one who is able to find contentment or even joy in what he has now not because it's everything, but because it's something. And gratitude is a Jewish spiritual practice. 
it's a practice that works to reorient us from a mindset of not enough, not enough, not enough to a wakeful recognition of all of the blessings that we have. That's why Rabbi Mayer tells us that we should make 100 blessings every single day. Find something, the most mundane elements, and just express your appreciation for it. So this year, I'm looking to Dayenu as a kind of spiritual exercise that's particularly well-suited to our time. The idea is not for us to silence our agitation and our sacred discontent. There is a lot to agitate for in this moment. You may have heard about a law that was signed in Georgia just this past week that actually makes it illegal to give water and food to people who are waiting online at polling places. There is a lot of work that needs to be done in the days ahead. But the idea is that in the midst of all of our struggles, personal and political, we must hold appreciation. We have to build a kind of spiritual resilience that will help us shift from a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of abundance. I know that this Pesach is going to be wonderful and also challenging. Wonderful because we're on our way out from this dark night of suffering. Day by day, we are getting closer to returning to our lives. We're healing and we're not just going back. There's a very good chance we're coming out of this better than we were as a nation when we went in. But we also know that it's gonna be challenging. Most of us are still not gonna be able to sit by, beside our loved ones on this Pesach. There are gonna be empty seats at our Seder tables this year. There are gonna be more surgeries ahead. There's more healing to come, more court battles, more legislative battles. There's real and profound loss that we're all experiencing individually and collectively. And there's so much at stake in this moment. This year, when I hear Dayenu, I'm going to try to remember that even though we don't have everything, there's so much that we do have. There's so much that we've learned. There's so much love. There's so much possibility. And all of that is ours to embrace on the journey toward freedom. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach.